Hi, and welcome back. And let's start with the question, why should I care? Who listens in mono in 2019? Well, actually, there are still quite a few scenarios where you might hear a mono down mix. And many of these are associated with music discovery. The first time someone hears your mix might be while scrolling through their social media feed or propping up the bar at the club. So you don't want the version they hear to suck too badly. Of course, a mono mix will never sound as good as a good stereo mix. Stereo can add depth as well as width and will always sound bigger and more impressive. But if you're careful, you can encode within your stereo mix a mono version that still hangs together as a song and makes musical sense. Let's go back to the beginning. Alan Blumlein pioneered modern stereo recording techniques back in the 1940s. The Blumlein pair he gave his name to is a pair of figure eight microphones placed as close together as possible, but angled 90 degrees apart. This means that signals to the left or the right of the array will end up louder in the left or right channel. But they arrive at both microphones at the same time, so there are no timing differences between the signals, and the left and right channels are perfectly in phase. The same happens when we use the pan pots in our mixers. Panning left makes the left channel louder and the right channel quieter, so the signal seems to move to the left. And vice versa. But we haven't introduced any timing or phase differences between the left and right channels. This is important. Phase differences can result in dramatic filtering or EQing effects when the signals are added together. And these are usually the most egregious mono compatibility issues. If there are only level differences between the channels, they'll add together nicely without any unexpected filtering side effects. Many people think this means perfect mono compatibility. But in fact, it's a bit more complicated than that. When you press the mono button on your master channel to check for mono compatibility, this simply adds the left and right channels together to create a mono sum, as you probably already knew. Well, actually, that's not quite true. Adding two identical signals results in a doubling of signal level which is equal to a 6.02 dB level boost. But pressing the mono button doesn't make a centrally panned signal get louder, because in fact, the mono sum is left plus right divided by two. If a signal is panned to the middle, it gets added to itself, then halved, so you end up back where you started. But if a signal is hard panned, so it's only in the left or right channel, it gets added to silence and then halved in level. So hard pan signals will end up almost exactly 6 dB lower in level in the mono down mix. Here's a practical example. Drums and bass are mono and centred, while guitar is panned hard left, and keys are panned hard right. When I drop this mix to mono, the guitar and keys parts seem to drop in level, while the bass and drums don't change, so we end up with a different balance. practice, of course, it's not really a 6 dB drop in loudness, as when it's monoed, the hard pan signals are now playing on two speakers instead of just one. But the signals from the two speakers don't add together as perfectly in the air as they do when summed electronically or digitally, and this generally only results in a perceived level boost of about 3 dB. So in reality, your hard pan signals will seem to get about 3 dB quieter when you listen in mono. How big a problem this is depends on a few things. Does the song still work if those panned elements are a bit quieter? If so, go ahead and pan them as wide as you like. But if the choruses lose their impact when the guitar is too quiet, you might want to consider panning that guitar part closer to the centre. At this point, you may be thinking, just change the pan law. Actually, this won't help. Let's look at why. Here we have pink noise panning left to right and back with a zero dB pan law. This means that when the signal is panned to the middle, it's a unity gain. When it pans left, the right channel is turned down while the left channel remains at unity and vice versa. 
This causes a problem when we're listening in stereo. When it's panned in the middle, it's playing at unity on both speakers, so it seems about 3 dB louder than when it's panned to the sides. And it's an even bigger problem in the mono down mix. Now it gets 6 dB louder when it's panned centrally. So let's switch to a minus 3 dB panel. This is ideal for stereo mixing. The signal now stays at about the same perceived level as it pans across the stereo field. But it's still not quite right in the mono down mix. Now it gets 3 dB louder whenever it's panned centrally. We can fix that by switching to a minus 6 dB pan law instead. Now the mono down mix stays at a constant level, but when we listen in stereo, the level seems to drop by 3 dB when the signal is panned to the middle. A minus 6 dB pan law is most appropriate where the mono down mix is more important than the stereo version, perhaps in broadcast contexts. But minus 3 dB is more normal to work well in stereo. And the minus 4.5 dB pan law is simply a compromise between the two, intended to be only slightly wrong in either case. But here's the thing, it doesn't really make any difference unless you're automating the panning of the part. When a part is panned to one static position, the choice of pan law will just change the overall level slightly, which you will compensate for with your channel fader to get the balance you want. When the mix is monoed, this doesn't pan all your channels back to the middle. It just adds left and right and divides by two. It doesn't care about your pan law. In the real world, the mono sum won't happen in your DAW anyway. Your stereo file will be monoed by whatever mono device it's being played on, which doesn't know or care what pan law you were set to. So anyway, how do we make a mix sound nice and wide without those wide pan parts getting too quiet in mono? One factor is, how good is the mix? I've deliberately made the mono elements in this example quite dense and thick, so there's little space in between the parts for the guitar and keys to poke through. This means a relatively small drop in level causes the hard pan parts to be masked by the mono elements. Now I'm going to simulate a much better mix by creating a much sparser arrangement, because of course those two things are intimately related. Now the drum and bass parts are much less busy, and they're much simpler in terms of spectral content. So there's much more space for the guitar and keys to fit around them. When there's more separation and space between each part, there's more leeway for the balance to change a bit without it all falling apart. Now when we listen in mono, those hard panned elements still get quieter. But they don't get buried in the same way they did before. So one way to ensure good mono compatibility is just to create a really awesomely good mix. A popular strategy is to build your mix in mono to begin with. Make all your main EQ decisions with your parts panned centrally. And make sure each part sits in its own space without relying on panning to create that separation. When the mix works well in mono, then you can start to pan parts left and right. And you'll be able to pan them further before mono compatibility becomes a problem. However, panning things hard left or right is not the only way to create a wide sounding mix. In fact, our ears are incredibly sensitive to subtle differences between left and right. It's possible to have the most important elements of the mix panned much closer to the middle, but use subtler cues to create that sense of width and depth. Textural elements like pads or this rhythmic noise patch are rarely the backbone of the song. So you can pan them as far left or right as you like if they get a bit quieter in the mono down mix, it's probably not going to matter. In fact, as the mono version has less space available for these kinds of parts, if they get a bit quieter in mono, that might be a good thing. In this case, there's no need to stop at hard panning. It's actually possible to pan signals further left or right than that. Here's how a mono signal looks on a traditional goniometer display. 
just a straight up and down line. If I pan this signal left, the line rotates anti-clockwise, but remains a straight line. And when it's hard panned, it sits at a 45 degree angle. And likewise, panning right rotates the line clockwise till it's at 45 degrees when hard panned. Now, what happens if I take that hard pan signal, flip the polarity to create the opposite signal, then add a little bit of that to the left channel? The answer is that hard pan signal rotates even further over and is now further right than hard panned. By far the easiest way to achieve this is by mid-side processing. Here I've routed two different parts to the same stereo subgroup, each hard panned in opposite directions. And I've loaded a Pro-Q3 on the group. Let's click to open the output panel. And notice the panning ring around the output volume knob. In fact, strictly speaking, with a stereo signal, it acts as a balance control. Turning it to the left attenuates the right channel only and vice versa. But if I click the little button below and to the right, I can switch to mid-side mode instead. Now, if I pan right, I'm actually turning down the mono sum of both channels while leaving the difference signal at unity. If I also turn up the overall gain to compensate, I've now just boosted the level of the side or difference channel. And this is literally the same as what I described earlier. We've taken a little bit of the left channel, flipped the polarity and added that to the right channel. And we've taken a little bit of the right channel, flipped the polarity and added it to the left channel. If we look at each part individually on the goniometer, we can see that toggling the EQ on and off widens that part from hard panned to even harder panned. Now, when we're listening in stereo, toggling the EQ on and off results in an audible volume change. When the EQ is on and boosting the side channel, those parts seem to get a bit louder. But what the EQ is doing is literally going to disappear in mono, as the side channel will just cancel out. So this kind of widening means that these parts will drop much more in apparent level when you mono the mix. But that's okay, because there's not much room for these parts in the mono mix anyway. If you want, you could go even further and remove the mid component completely. The result will look like a horizontal line on the goniometer, and might seem like it's coming from somewhere behind you when you listen in stereo. But this is going to literally disappear completely in mono, which is a bit too extreme in most cases. Let's extend this concept to the use of effects. I treat my delay and reverb return channels as just another set of mix elements. I'll go ahead and process them however is required to make them fit in the mix, just like any other channel. And this also applies to how they're panned. Let's add some delay to the guitar via a mono send but then consider where we can pan that delay. I can hard pan it in the opposite direction to the dry signal, and the guitar part now bounces from left to right in a pleasant manner, and we've added a great sense of depth. Or I could hard pan it the same way as the dry signal. Now that guitar part seems to be panned further to the left, even though the dry signal is only panned halfway. And because the delay is hard panned, but the dry signal isn't, the mono version will be a little bit drier with relatively less delay. This is often a good thing, as the mono mix has so much less space available for these kinds of effects. Reverb is just as critical. In fact, simply sending a part or two to a stereo reverb with no special trickery involved can add a great sense of width and depth. If you turn Pro R's stereo width knob up past 100%, this is like widening the 100% setting with some mid-side trickery. This helps to enhance the sense of space and width the reverb adds in stereo. But the reverb will seem to get quieter in mono, which again is often a good thing.
Conversely, however, and perhaps counterintuitively, one of the most powerful ways to create a wide sounding mix is to turn the stereo width all the way down for the reverb. We can now pan it hard left or right, as we did with the delay. Or alternatively, we could pan it to the same position as the dry signal. This places the part very firmly at that location in the mix. The part itself is less wide, but the contrast between its placement and other elements of the mix can sometimes make a more compelling stereo image. And of course, this way the dry-wet mix won't change at all when you listen in mono, so this is a good choice when the reverb is really important to the sound of that part. OK, before I leave you, let's pull up the goniometer again. Here's a mono signal, panned centrally, and panned left, and right, and back in the middle. Now look what happens if, instead of panning the signal, I instead create phase differences between the channels. Phase differences between left and right channels kind of break the rules that Alan Blumlein laid out in the 1940s, but nevertheless can create a really wide and spacious feel. And if you do it very carefully, it can still be mono-compatible. That's going to be the subject of part two. Thanks for watching.